anticipation that you have something to say to us. And that is unbelievable, that the God of all things personally knows me, knows my situation, knows where I need encouragement or where I need to be challenged or corrected. And I'm, I'm just waiting for your words today. I'm praying that we would get into position to listen, that we would tune in and push out all the distraction, hoping for your words today. So if you're open to hearing uh, from God today, I invite you to pray this very simple prayer that we pray every week together as a church. If you're new, just a quiet prayer between you and God, something like this. Jesus, would you please speak to me today? Because I am listening. And then would you pray for somebody else? Because it's not all about me or you. It's, it's about us together. Would you pray for someone else? Maybe somebody you're seated beside, came to church with today. Simple prayer for them, something like this. God, please talk to this person today. And give them the faith and the courage to respond to you. And Lord, I don't know if I should keep praying for the Broncos because it's not working. But I'm praying, I'm going to persist that they'll be winners again. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Hey, we're wrapping up this series called Fresh Produce, and it's all about how we grow and change and how God produces fresh new character in our lives. And as the followers of Jesus, something happens inside of us gradually and inevitably over time as we follow Jesus, something is produced within us, a character that, that changes and evolves over time. Uh, we've said this throughout the series that, that God wants his children to grow, that he loves them exactly the way they are, but he wants them to keep taking steps and progressing and maturing. And every parent in the room understands this. Like you want, you love your two-year-old exactly where they are, but when they're 12, you hope they have a different behavior. You hope they have a different attitude. You hope they have different life skills. And when they're 22, you hope they're not acting like 12-year-olds. Like you love them and you couldn't love them anymore, but you want them to grow and mature. And our good, good father wants that for every one of his children as well. And as we bump into Jesus, things change in our life. When we intersect with the Son of God, something happens. You can't bump into some, something like that and it not lead us down a different path. And sometimes we get stuck and we go through seasons and we go, why, why aren't I changing? Why aren't I looking more and more like Jesus? And so that's what this series has been about is how do we grow spiritually? How do we produce the fruit that God is looking for in our lives. When you came in, you received a bulletin. Inside that bulletin is a little outline. Almost every week we give you something you can take notes on. I like to write things down and take notes because it just helps me to remember. I hope that I will remember things when I leave. Sometimes I come to services like this and I'm inspired, but when I write things down, it helps me to remember them. It takes some verses home with you to read on your own. And so if you want to take some notes and write some things down, I encourage you to do that. The theme verses for this past three weeks have been John 15, 8, and a couple of others. We're going to read in a few minutes, but it says this, uh, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. He says, this is God's will, this is God's heart, that you as the followers of Jesus would bear not a little bit of fruit, but a lot of fruit, much fruit, uh, showing yourselves to be my disciples. In other words, when we walk by an apple tree and we see apples on it, that's how we know it's an apple tree, it's produced this fruit. If you walk by an orange tree, you see orange, you go, oh, that's an orange tree because it's produced this fruit. And the followers of Jesus will be known by certain characteristics. In other words, we don't do those things to become Christians, but because we are followers of Jesus, those things will be produced in our lives. And people around us will bump into us and go, oh, they must be followers of Jesus because these things are happening in their lives. They're different. When you bump into an old high school teammate or a college roommate or somebody used to work with five seasons ago, they should say, something's different about you. Something has changed in you because you're following Jesus. And they might not even be able to put their finger on it because you're not that crazy religious nut job, but they just go, something's different with you. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, the fruit of the Spirit is. In other words, as I follow the Spirit of Jesus... As I follow the Holy Spirit, something gets produced in my life. Love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Those are all things that we want more of in our life. 
If you had a little more love, if you had a little more patience, if you had a little more self-control, your life would be in a better place. And the scripture promises inevitably and gradually these things will be produced in us as we follow Jesus and people will begin to notice that. This is, this is the fruit that we're talking about. Over the last several weeks, we've used this botanical example that Jesus uses out of John chapter 15. On the Thursday night before Jesus is crucified on Friday, he's having a conversation with his closest disciples, 12, and then Judas leaves, so he's talking to 11 men. He's handing off the reins of the ministry, the movement of Jesus to these 11 guys. And so how many of you know that last words are really important? And someone tells you the last thing they're going to tell you before they go, it's really important. And Jesus is trying to communicate, this, this is what's really important. This is how we grow spiritually. And I want you to pass this on. And here we are a couple thousand years later talking about this because they took him seriously. And he begins to talk about this botanical example. About He, he starts talking about seed and soil. And then he talks about vine and branches. He says, like, the seed is the words of God, the word of God, the scripture, and it goes into our life and our lives, our hearts are the soil, and where it lands matters. So our part is cultivating our hearts so that, the, that we receive what God wants to say to us. I say a, a lot when we come here on Sunday morning, like your expectation level really determines your experience. Like if your heart is open and you're saying, God, I don't, my life's hard right now. I've got questions, this or that. But if my heart is open, I'm able to receive what God may want to say to me. Last week we talked about vine and branches, that Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. And as long as we stay connected to the vine, that there's this inevitable result of fruit and growth in our lives, that something is produced. And we, get, we all get that example. If you cut a branch off of a tree, there's not a lot of hope that fruit is going to be produced at the end of that branch because it's been severed from its source. And it's the same way spiritually for us. How do we stay connected to Jesus? And well, those messages, if you missed them, are on our website and on iTunes and everywhere that you can listen to stuff like that. And you can go back and put some of that into your life. But today, we want to talk about the third major character in the story that John is, excuse me, Jesus is talking about in John 15, God the gardener. So if you have a Bible and you want to turn over with me, we're going to look in John chapter 15. Uh, it's a little bit of, of the verses we were at last week. I always encourage you to bring your Bibles, even though we put it on the screen and into the outline, because sometimes it's good. I like it to, to like flip over my own personal Bible and make some notes and jot some things down. Uh, I thought maybe it was a little bit sacrilegious when I first became a Christian to write in your Bible, but uh, it's not. Uh, it's not the... The book that is sacred is the words of truth that last forever. Um, and so I like to write. And in my Bible, there's all kind of highlights and underlines and things that I can go back and remember uh, through, through time. So make notes in the margins. And sometimes in my Bible, it, it says things like, well, that doesn't make sense. Or God, I don't understand how that works uh, because God already knows you're thinking that. So it's okay. John chapter 15, beginning in verse number one, it says this, uh, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener and he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it'll be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. So we're going to drill down into these first four verses in John chapter 15. We looked at the ending part of this chapter last week, if you were with us. But when we come together as a body of believers here at Journey, we want to open the Bible and we want to read through the words. We want to say, what is this saying to me? What is God trying to communicate? I always say that the Bible is the only book that the author is always present when it's being read. And the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit will instruct us as we read his words. He will, he will bring things to the surface. He will help us to understand some things. And he begins to say what we talked about last week. I'm the vine, you're the branches, and my father is the gardener. Now, what does the gardener do? He begins to explain. He says, the gardener comes through the vineyard and begins a process of pruning. So today, we're going to talk about this big idea about how we become more fruitful, have fresh produce in our life, by God our Father pruning or disciplining us or correcting us or rebuking us so even more fruit 
will be produced. Aren't you so glad you came to church this morning? I thought about like, you know, posting this last night. Hey, we're going to talk about God's discipline tomorrow at church, but it would have been me and my wife because she has to come and three other people who would have been like, yes, but it is an amazing idea. It's true and it's, and it's good. He goes on to say, he's like, my, my father is, he's a, he's a good gardener. He's a good vine dresser. And for these men, they would have this botanical example, this examples of, of vine branches and, and producing fresh fruit, it would have been, it was so evident all around them. It's like you grew up in Napa Valley. You would have seen these vineyards everywhere. And so they, they just grabbed on to that simple illustration that Jesus is trying to teach. And he says, my father comes through and he begins to prune or cut some things. So let's take a few notes today, write some things down. It's, the word pruning means to cut or to lift up. In other words, he comes by and he starts to cut off some things that aren't being productive or fruitful in our lives. And then it also means, the same word means to lift up. So when the gardener comes by, he, it's not willy-nilly. It, it, there's a real precision to it. When he comes by and cuts off these branches, he doesn't, he doesn't come with like a hedge clipper. He comes very delicately and very methodically And he cuts off certain branches that he knows will begin to produce more and more fruit from the root of the vine. He cuts off certain branches in our lives so that the right amount of fruit and the best fruit will be produced. As I was like researching this and studying this, I find myself reading articles and things that I, I never thought I would, but I, you know, I'm Googling, how do you prune a vineyard? Like I want to, and what I found out is just, I mean, it's interesting information. It was an article from Napa Valley that the highest paid workers, the most skilled workers in a vineyard are those who prune. Because they know just the right places and just the right time to cut and prune the, the branch so that it will produce the right amount of fruit. So as it grows, it begins to grow in all different kinds of directions. And some of those branches produce an enormous amount of fruit. Some of them produce no fruit. Some of them, even I was reading this article and it said the, the exact week of the year matters. Like some would prune their vineyards uh, in early February, some in early March, and they had you know kind of some conflicting information about that. But it was more of a it was more of a heart than than a science. It was more of a an art as as he walked through. And I get this now. This is really important. Like Jesus says, like the the vine dresser, the gardener, he knows his vineyard, and he walks up and down, and he knows what's happened that year. He knows if we, how much rainfall they had or snow or, or the, the temperature. And he knows as he walks down the vineyard exactly where to snip and cut so that the next season will produce the most amount of fruit. And it even said things like, if you cut it too early, the wine tastes like this. If you cut it too late, it tastes like this. It, it, was, it was really interesting. And it just reminded me that our God the gardener, the good, good father in our lives comes by and knows where to cut, where to snip, where to remove. And then here's, here's the other big picture that I learned is that the same word to cut off is also the same word to, to lift up. The, the branch automatically wants to grow toward the ground wants to grow toward the dark places. But the gardener knows that if it is lifted up and put onto the, the trestle there, the wire that goes across, that if, it's, if it grows there, he, he will pull it up and begin to wrap it around that trestle so that it can get the right amount of air, moisture, and sunlight to produce the most amount of fruit. Now, this is such a simple illustration, but isn't this a beautiful picture of how God looks at all of his children and says, there are certain things in your life that need to be cut off. There are certain things that that need to be removed. And then there are other times when I need to lift you up from the places that you think you need to go so that you can get the right amount of nutrient, the right amount of sunshine, the right amount of light in your life to produce the most amount of fruit. And sometimes that pruning is also called discipline in the scripture. So I want to read you just a handful of verses when it comes to pruning and cutting and, and lifting up uh, this idea. One, one quick thought before we jump into some practical things is 
When you walk by a vineyard in February and the gardener has just come through and, and cut all the branches off, it's a pretty barren looking spot, right? It, it doesn't look like there's a lot of health there, right? It looks cold and dark and damp and may, maybe your, your soul feels like that this morning. Maybe God has been clipping some things away and you think, I don't, I can't possibly see with this picture how this is going to produce something good and fruitful in my life. I mean, if I was being honest, like this is hard. This stinks. And it doesn't look like anything's coming. And it just feels like God has just come into my life with the hedge clippers and shaved everything off. And I'm wondering, like, where is this going to go? So today I want to talk about this concept about how God prunes disciplines. And don't think punishment. Think correct. Think lead to the right path. So number one, if you're taking some notes, God only disciplines, this is good news, those in his family. So if I'm going through some really tough times in my life and I feel like God may be pruning or disciplining or correcting me, I'm going through some hard times in my life, uh, God only disciplines those that he loves and are a part of his family. Now, I have a 17-year-old and a 14-year-old, and as long as I can remember, I've been disciplining them, right? In some ways, punishing them at some points when they were really, really young, but and more often than not, correcting, right? Just guiding them along a certain path, saying no to this and cutting this off in their life so that it could head in a positive direction. And I, want to, I just want to speak to some of the parents who are here in the room that you have toddlers, like you're in that season of life from like birth up until like seven, eight years old, and it's exhausting. Like it's overwhelming, and no one prepares you for it, right? No one tells you how incredibly draining it will be. And what, to me, like some of the most difficult parts of that were the correction, like just the constant disciplining of your children, like over and over. And did you, do you feel like right now, if you're in that season or if you just come out of that season, it, that everything that you ever say sounds something like this, no, stop, quit, don't, get off, quit, the, get off your sister. If you do that again, I swear, one, two, three, like you just, does anybody, is anybody living there right now? It's just this constant... And you're like, just exhaust. I remember very specifically, I was in Arkansas as a youth pastor and we had, uh, my, my, my kids were very small, like three and just born, like in the carrier. I come home from work, long day at work. I love it. I'm having a great time at work because I left them at home. And uh, anybody know what I'm talking, any moms know what I'm talking about? And then any guys like now afraid to tell your wife who's happened to be staying home with your toddlers what you had for lunch today? Does anybody you know what I'm talking about? You're like, well, where did you go for lunch today? Well, we went over here. We went to this cool taco place. Whatever. And then you get the, well, great. I had peanut butter and jelly for the 79th time. Glad you enjoyed your day. And so it, I come home. I see my wife, Amy, standing there. She's holding the hand of our three-year-old with the other, my daughter, in the carrier, just standing in the driveway. And I pull in. I'm like, what? Or what are you, what, what, what are you, what are you doing? What's, what's happening in this moment right now? I'm afraid. Do you ever feel that fear when you come home in? <laughs> something's going on. Something's wrong. Uh, and it, it's, that, it's that season of life. She's, just, she's got that thousand yard stare. It's frantic. It's, I don't know what to do. I used to, used to watch those commercials for shaken baby syndrome. And you think, how could anybody do that? And then you had a kid and you're like, oh, I see why they have these commercials. <laughs> Right, And so she's like, we got to go somewhere right now. We got to get out of here. I'm like, why don't I take the kids and we'll go in the house. And she's like, no, I want us to do it as a family. And I'm like, okay. And so we went to a shopping center and I never got out of the car with the kids. She just, it was like a strip mall. She went in a store and I would just pull the car down. Just pull the car down to the next thing. Just trying to keep the kids quiet and doing her thing. That's, that's good advice, husbands. And so, um, but we were living in that moment of, wow. This is so hard. But why were we doing that? We were disciplining them because we love them, because we had a vision for their future, right? Look at this verse together in Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. 
This is my child. Don't reject the Lord's discipline or pruning. Don't be upset when he corrects you, for the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. When I feel like something is being pruned in my life, I need to understand that God is trying to correct me and pull me back on course, that he's got something better for me. And I can say my kids are not perfect. They are not. But I want to say to the parents who are in that season of life where you're just trying to be consistent in discipline and being on the same page, that you fast forward a decade And my kids aren't perfect, but that discipline paid off. Like that fruit has now produced in responsible young men and women. And so just keep going. I know it's so hard, but just keep pressing in. And because we discipline those we love, those who are in our family, we don't discipline people. I want to discipline kids who aren't in my family, but you get arrested for that. So (laughs) don't do that. Number two is, is this, is that God's pruning is always for our good, and it's to stimulate growth. When something difficult is happening in my life, some trial, some hardship, God is like a good parent or a good teacher or a good coach, many times orchestrating the circumstances of our life to produce character in us, to cause us to respond to the events or circumstances of our life so that we will grow. Anyone who's ever worked out understands this. You put yourself under pressure. You get sore so you can get strong. You go through difficult challenges so that you can be stronger at the end. Anyone's ever been an athlete? Anyone's ever practiced uh, an instrument over and over again? You do that so that growth will be stimulated and God is trying to correct us and bring us back on to a path. I go to Walmart. I don't know about you. I go to Walmart somewhere between 17 and 19 times a week. Does anybody do this? Because every time I go, I end up forgetting the thing that I actually needed to bring with me. And then I, my wife and I play out this scenario a lot where we walk in together to Walmart or whatever. And I say, hey, do you think we need a cart? And she says, no, we're just going to get a couple of things. And now, do you know where this is headed? Okay, because if you've been married for any amount of time, you do. Because you walk in and she sees 70 other things that we need. And who ends up carrying all those? Yours truly. And so I think, why didn't we get a cart? But then every time I go to get a cart, it never, ever fails when I go and get the cart. I get the wheel. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and you're pushing it along. And somehow the wheel knows not to act up until you get at least 100 yards away from the other carts. Does it not? It's like it works perfectly until you're going down the cereal aisle. You're like, what happened? And this thing just crashing into the Cheerios. And you're just, do you know what I'm talking about? You're doing that little push with the right hand to try to keep it straight. You're making marks on the Walmart floor. I feel like so many times spiritually, I'm, I'm the grocery cart and God is just trying to, I keep veering off, veering off, and he's correcting me, and he allows things to happen in my life, pruning, discipline, correction in my life to keep me on course so that fruit will be produced. So I want to give you just a couple things that might help you recognize when some of the pruning is going on in your life. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list, and it doesn't mean when these things happen that it's always God specifically disciplining us or pruning us, but it might be a situation or circumstance that God wants to use to help you grow in your life. The first one is this, is that God removes certain people from our life. Maybe you go through a breakup You think, I thought that was the one, we were really close, and then all of a sudden, our past parted. Maybe it's a roommate that you have some conflict with, they leave your life. Maybe it's friends that at one time you were really, really tight, but all of a sudden, you're just not around them anymore. Maybe it's a coworker that you really like trusted and valued but they got transferred and now you're in that office by yourself and, and they're, they're gone and you think, man, I really, I really enjoyed being with that person. And it's not that they were bad. It was just, it was really easy for me to lean into them. But now I'm having to look to God more than I ever have. Maybe God removes certain people from your life because even though it feels like they're friends, they're, they're not leading you down the direction that you want to go spiritually. And God knew you weren't strong enough to like break it off. So he removes them. And uh, I don't know about you, but if we were all kind of stand up and tell the the dumbest thing we've ever done, 
uh, rarely are we alone. <laughs> Normally we're with people that, that encourage us down the wrong path. Uh, sometimes as a parent or even just as an outsider, you look at teenagers and you say, wow, they really need to get a better circle of friends around them because they're giving into that peer pressure. Well, as adults, we're not immune to that. Like we're, we're, we are the sum total of the people that we surround ourselves with. And sometimes God will remove that, th- those couple of couple friends that you have because they're not encouraging you to grow spiritually. How about this? I hate this one. Sometimes God will keep difficult people in your life to prune and discipline you and help you to grow. I mean, you're praying that God would remove this person. Like, why did they leave? I like them and this person, I can't get rid of them. Right? Maybe it's a boss that you work for. You're like, this person, they just, I, I have such a hard time. I, have, I don't have any trouble with anybody else, but this person, God, drive me crazy. A coworker you're on a project with, and every day you come home and tell your roommate or your spouse, your friends, like, this person drives me crazy. Maybe you married into a family. It's an in-law situation. Like, I married you, but I didn't know who I was marrying them. And, but you're stuck, and like the holidays are coming, and you're thinking, man, I've got to see them, and Sometimes God keeps difficult people in our lives because it's those relationships that brings that character and that dealing with my patience or my self-control in this moment. Sometimes God allows that person to stay in your life because he's developing something. Sometimes God cuts away, lifts up, removes areas around our security and control. This might look like I didn't get that promotion uh, I lost my job, the recession hits, and my bank, my, my bank account starts to dwindle, and everything that it was giving me a lot of security is not, not where it was, or it's gone. Uh, and then it leads us to a place of openness that we've never been before, because we're losing things that are our security and control, like our force field for life's hardships. I was just uh, back in Atlanta when I went to see my dad who's battling cancer a couple of weeks ago. And I met up with a mentor, my old youth pastor, and, and he was having lunch with a couple of guys. And he said, hey, why don't you join us? And I sat down with them and I'm listening to these two guys he's having lunch with one of their stories. Um, and in my hometown, they have just built like some of the largest sound stages in the world. Like it's called Pinewood Studios. Like all the Marvel movies are filmed there, and uh, it's really crazy. Like I drive, it's like out in a cow pasture, and but it's just south of the airport, so it's easy access. And and years ago, Georgia enacted this law that was like a tax benefit for Hollywood studios to come and film there. So I'm talking to the guy across from me who is the owner of all those studios. He's built all of them. His business partner is Dan Cathy, who is the president of Chick-fil-A, Christian Chicken. And so uh, God bless Christian Chicken. <laughs> so and Dan Cathy, actually, when I was in Atlanta, taught 12th grade Sunday school for me uh, when I was a youth pastor. And so it was a good friend. And so I was like, I know Dan. And we struck up this conversation. I said, well, how did you get into this? And he said, well, it was like 2007, 8, 9 when the recession hit and I was in commercial real estate and I lost everything. I mean, everything fell apart, everything I'd worked 30 years for. Some of you, that might be your experience. You've been through something like that. And he said, I, he said, I spent my last thousand dollars on this deal to try to get a contract. Like I flew somewhere to meet with this person and he said, and it just all fell apart. He said, I remember exactly where I was. I left the city hall meeting and I was sitting in my car just like in tears. And I came home thinking I had to tell my sons I'm bankrupt. I had to look at my wife and say, hey, it's gone. We don't have anything. And he said, I just, in that moment, just broke. And he, right there in the restaurant, I mean, this is you know, eight or 10 years ago, he just started crying. He goes, I remember right where I was when I said, God, I can't do this. Like, I I just surrender. And he said, you know, up until that point, I I went to church. I kind of believed in God. But it was in that moment of pruning, discipline, correction, that I was finally open to what God wanted to do in my life. Now, a series of events happened later, and he was able to get the contract and build these studios. And, you know, it's kind of a success story on the end. But how many of you have ever been through something like that in your life? And it's like, this is the hardest thing I've ever been through. It's the hardest thing I've ever gone through. But I I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy, but I'm more open to God than I ever have been. And guess what? This is hard teaching. But God's agenda for your life is not that you be blessed or be successful. 
but that you, but that you have a relationship with him. And that he will, he will go to unimaginable effort to open the door so that you will be open to him. Because that's what matters in the end. Like that's what will last forever. And it's, st- I mean, pruning always hurts. It always cut. We always go, what are you doing? But then we're actually talking to God and open to him. Last one is this. This is a tough one is that God sometimes in our life will expose our secrets and here's what that might look like, is that you've been struggling with something secretly. And it could be some type of an addiction to painkillers or alcohol or some other drug abuse, pornography, some type of sexual issue in your life, an affair that's going on. And here's what I know from talking to so many people in my life is that, um, that many times people are, are open in those moments and they're struggling with something, it's pulling them down, and they're praying a prayer, something like this, God, will you please, please get me out of this? I don't want to do, you fill in the blank, anymore. I want this relationship to be over. And what we mean by that prayer is, God, can you get me out of this with no consequences? Can you get me out of this without anybody finding out? Can you get me out of this without my husband finding out or my wife finding out? Can you just like take away this desire to do this or that or let them go away? But oftentimes, we're, never, we're not strong enough to break through that and God will rip the curtain back and expose our secrets. And then we, we're forced to deal with it. Some of you, that's your story. You might be right in the middle of it. You might be here at church today because you're like, you know, yeah, I, that's been revealed. And I don't know what to do. Maybe you're on the back side of that. And, and you, you would say what I said a few minutes ago. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Because then I was able to get healing. And then I was able to, there's fruit in my life from that. Last thing, big idea today is uh, there's no pruning without pain. Like it, it's never easy. Uh, but there's always the promise of greater fruit. God is not vindictive. God is not trying to punish you indiscriminately. When God cuts away or prunes something in our life, it's always for a vision of the future that he has for his children. Look at this verse together. Close with this. It's in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, and then 10 through 11. It says, The Lord disciplines the one he loves. So if you feel like you're under the thumb today, know you're loved. He chastises every son or daughter whom he receives, and he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful, there it is, fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It's never easy to embrace the discomfort, but the reward for avoiding the pain is just staying the same. God has an agenda in mind. Press into the discomfort. So, aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> this is a hard teaching. This is, this is difficult to imagine because so many times we think God is the genie in the bottle and he exists to make my life pleasant and without uh, discomfort. But God has a purpose in mind, an end in that. Not one time in the years of disciplining my son, spanking him in the early days, you know, because he, uh, he was crazy and a wild child, did he ever look back at me and go, thank you, Father. That was amazing. Can we do this again tomorrow? But I can say, like, he, he's not perfect by any means. But I can say, like, those moments of correction, rebuke, and discipline have led him to become a great young man. The same with my daughter. And some of you, that's the experience you have of raising children. Or you could say, whew, my mama, whoo. And she did it because she loved me. So today's teaching, teachings are, are hard, are difficult. But if we can press in and go, God, what are you trying to teach me? What, what are you trying to show me in this? I know that this is not punishment for no reason, are you trying to correct me so that certain fruit can grow in my life? Why don't we pray together? The band's going to come. We'll sing one last song. 
as they come, let's pray. And we always want to have a message in a moment here at Journey where you can connect with God and maybe apply the message to your life. And so let me ask you as we pray, uh, do you feel like maybe this morning that there's an area of your life that God might be trying to prune, cut away, a habit, a sin, a relationship? Has God left a difficult person in your life? Have you been exposed? And now you're thinking, how do, I, how do I climb out of this? Would you maybe pray something like this to the Lord? God, I know this hard thing is happening, but I know you love me. Will you please show me what you're trying to teach me? Will you help me to grow through this and have fresh produce, new character, on the other side. Maybe uh, this morning, uh, the truth is, the thing that might be hitting you today is, like, I, I need God to be my father. Like, I, I've kind of believed in God, but I've never really had a relationship with him. And today, maybe you're willing to start that. You're willing to begin and ask God to uh, come into your life. Maybe you would say something like this. Maybe you would have a prayer something like this. God, I, I believe in you. I believe that Jesus lived for me and died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave. I believe that. And Jesus, I'm asking you to come into my life. Forgive me and help me to get started on a journey with you. So, Father, as we gather this morning, uh, we know that you're a, a father who loves his kids, wants to see them grow. I pray that we would yield ourselves to that process, open our hearts, stay connected to you, and recognize when you're correcting us, and, and God respond to that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand to our feet. We'll sing one last song together. Spreading a great morning together. Let's take these few moments that we have left and let's let's really take hold of them. Let's let God do something powerful as we go out of this place today, okay?